Hi. The cosmos here, this is, uh, I think most of us would agree, a thing of beauty. But it's a little bit difficult to navigate without a little training, right? And for a lot of law students, if you can picture this, but all of these coming at you, that's sort of what law school feels like, especially in the first year, but other years too. And what I mean by that is that each one of these piece of points of light represents some distinct idea, some concept. And the law students are getting overloaded with them. They're coming flying at them from all directions. They know they're important. They know that somehow they're probably related to each other. And that's about all they know, right? Other than that, they're feeling a little panicky. And so what do we do? Um, we do what we have done for generations when we're presented with what seem like discrete phenomena. Right? We look for patterns. We look for, we look for relationships. Right? And you know, we certainly are not the first people to think of this. In fact, um, this same sky, this exact same sky, ancient Chinese traders developed in their mind a series of relationships based on that sky, used this map to cross the Gobi Desert at night. At night, of course, the, des the desert is a lot cooler, and it makes crossing possible. It also makes getting back home possible. And, of course, the Chinese weren't the only culture to develop these types of maps. This is a much more, obviously, elaborate map. But you see this figure here, this snake figure. That figure, if you notice, appeared in the previous one as well, right? the, previous, the previous map. This figure was first, at least as far as we know in writing, identified by Ptolemy of Alexandria. Egypt, not, not Virginia. Um, but Ptolemy himself credited not, did not claim that he had discovered it, but rather that it was the product of generations of Phoenician and Greek sailors who used it to cross the Mediterranean again at night and to get back home. Okay, so that's a little foundation for you. Now I'm going to tell you a story. But before I do, I want you to focus on this, this character, Draco, and Hold that image in your mind a bit while I talk to you. So, I started teaching law in 2007 at William Mitchell in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I was very quickly asked to teach a course that I did not feel particularly confident in teaching, which was first year property law, right? which of course is a big course, right? And uh, I was not at all sure that I was going to be able to fool the students into believing I knew what I was talking about. And in the course of my learning how to teach that course and the other courses that I eventually took on, one of the things that I found myself doing all the time was mapping out concepts, was mapping out ideas, just pencil and paper, right? Just so that I could see how the various parts of the course related to each other. And eventually, my walls of my office are basically covered with, this was the artwork in my office, was essentially uh, hand-drawn concept maps filling up walls. Now, you know, sometimes we're, we are told that people have like a eureka moment, where they, suddenly an idea hits them. I never had a eureka moment. I had a eureka half decade. <laughs> right? Very, very slow Eureka, if you can picture that. But it occurred to me, after about a year of doing this, that if I'm learning the material this way, maybe it would be helpful for the students to have these charts as well. Right? And maybe sometimes we could even build them together. Right? So I started to make photocopies of the charts right? and hand them out as supplements, supplements to the casebook that I was using. The casebook I was using came out with a new edition. Trivial changes. Just about enough to mess up the pagination and not much more. Right? But it's, but it, and, well, it destroyed our ability to use the previous edition of the casebook. 
essentially. And it occurred to me that it's a shame that the charts that I was handing out didn't have the cases in them, because then we wouldn't need the book. And the book, as it turned out, as I discovered to my horror, after assigning it without ever asking for years on end, was $250. And that's not unusual. That's not unusual. It's also not unusual that we, professors, don't know how much we're charging our students. We get it free. Right? We make a decision on behalf of 75 other people without regard to price. And we wonder why our students are in such debt. So, with that in mind, my slow eureka moment is continuing. <laughs> About a year after first saying, boy, that's too bad, I thought to myself, actually, you know, like somebody who knows something about computers could probably make that happen. Right? Not me. I don't know anything about computers. But somebody, I assume, could make it happen. I mean, they came up with Google, they could probably do that, right? And then about three months later, it finally occurred to me, what, are, what, do, you, what do you call those people? What, are the, what do you call people who make stuff with computers? Like, I know that there's websites and there's website developers, but like, how do people, what, do you, what are those people who make computers do things called? Right? It took me about three weeks to figure that out. Developers, you probably already knew that. I was a little slow. And so I took this idea, the pencil and paper drawings, to some developers. And I asked them, could we do this? The answer is yes, we could. We could actually do this. We could create interactive concept maps with the content for the entire course embedded within. The only problem is it was going to be expensive. So then the next thing I had to so slowly decide is whether or not to spend my children's college fund. And I did. I decided to go ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> they're young. They have years to recover from this. Right? Actually, they're not that young. My son's 18. But anyway, <laughs> he can earn a scholarship. Um, in any case, so went ahead and we did it. And the result, I'm going to show you now. This is the result. It's called Charter Course. And what we've done is we've taken entire law school courses and formatted them as concept maps. So now, at a glance, they can see at a glance how each concept taught in the course relates to every other concept taught in the course. One glance, and you can see that. And what's more is we build a trail. We build a trail from on the right-hand side, the specific. The left is the general. And at each moment when you've assigned content in this class, the student knows why they're studying it. Right? We say that you can see the forest and the trees simultaneously always. But you'll notice that in addition to opening up the map by clicking, we're also bringing up this card over here on the left. And in that card is embedded all of the content for that particular node. So for example, this is Fourth, and Fourth Amendment, search and seizure. Exceptions to the warrant requirement, search incident to arrest. Students know immediately why they're studying search incident to arrest, because it's part of this topic of exceptions to the warrant requirement, which is part of the Fourth Amendment law of search and seizure. But in addition to that, God help us, yes, we've got, all of the cases, all of the cases that are direct, well, I should say, all of the canonical cases plus are built into the chart. This case, Riley versus California, was decided on June 25th, 2014. I was teaching this course with this chart when this case was decided. Two days after it was decided, we were discussing it in class because instantly we can update something that case books, no matter how much they charge, simply don't seem to be able to do. The other nice thing is that in this application, students can take their notes right into it, and it's saved for them. And they will always be saved for them. They're always there. Anytime they open that case, they click on the note icon, they get their notes. 
What else can this thing do? Well, you know, we give the same sort of background reading that you find in case books as well. All right? This is what we call our essentials. This is the material that usually you find introducing a topic in a case book or connecting the cases in a case book. But, oops, one of the things that you'll see there is that we can highlight. And in fact, one of the things you'll notice is there's a big palette of highlight colors. This was at the student's insistence, right? It turns out that they highlight in code. Do you know this? Uh, see, I never knew that. And I, I, why do you need so many colors? That's why they need so many colors, right? The nice thing is, too, that the highlights are also saved. To, uh, sorry, let me move that. Bam. Okay, the highlights will also be saved. The next time they open it, the highlights are there, okay? We can also do things that really bring the topic to life. This is a video about the search incident to arrest exception. It's a dash cam from a police car. What's happening in the, in the video? A search incident to arrest. Right? The man's been arrested, the police are searching him. This is a well-known clip among constitutional criminal law professors, I believe, because it's a very funny clip. I won't play it because it won't work well with the cameras, but while they're emptying his pockets, this man is suspected of holding up a bank. He eats the hold-up note because they don't perform their search incident to arrest very well, but it was caught on camera. All right, I'll show you some of the other things that you can do with this type of technology. You know, one of the things that it's important to remember is that not everybody, when they look into a cosmos and see patterns, see the same patterns, right? In other words, how I like to teach this course may not be how you like to teach this course. But with this technology, unlike a casebook, you can rearrange it. You can rearrange the nodes to fit your own teaching. You can add or delete content to fit your own teaching. Okay. And let me show you. We have what we call, oh yes, sorry. Um, there we go. Search and seizure, putting it all together. So we often have a node that is just for practice, right? So here, for example, is a fact situation, typical law school exam fact situation. Right? And if we scroll down, which I'm sure I can do somehow on this. Uh, there we go. You can see that there are a number of questions that we ask of the students. Now, when they're answering those questions, we have another feature that they can use. And if you like graphics, you're really going to like this. Okay. So we have something we call guideposts. And guideposts, the idea with guideposts, is that what we're doing is we are training the students not to find the right answer, but something much, much more important, which is to ask the right questions. Right? The answers change based on the facts. The questions stay the same. So what this says is probably difficult for you to see, but what it says is, was the intrusion at issue a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment? And you have two choices. They're not yes or no. The choices are, if yes, what is the next question we should ask? If no, what is the next question we should ask? And students can use these guideposts as they do their practice exams. Okay? All right. Now, maybe this is a little bit easier in the context of constitutional criminal procedure than some other courses, but I don't think so. We've got, at the moment, we've got six courses that are live. They're all authored by law professors at different law schools around the country. Um, and I want to show you, the other, I have authored two of them, this one and property law. And I want to show you the property law one to show you that even for a topic as staid and I guess um, there's not usually a lot of excitement in property law, I'm afraid. Not always, but not usually, right? But we can do something with this technology to bring it to life for our students. So, I have this divide, this is useful for me to divide it up this way. I have property law divided up into the four basic property rights that we usually think of in, in the Anglo-American common law tradition. And here we get out to servitudes, oh God, everybody hates this. Equitable servitudes and real covenants, very, very boring, right? And you'll notice that among the cases we have over here are all the canonical cases. So, oops. 
So even things as old as Tulk versus Moxe, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember having to read that in law school, um, but it's from 1750s in England. Shelley v. Kramer, however, is a case you may well remember. Shelley v. Kramer was the case that broke the back of racially restrictive covenants, or I should say broke the legal imprature on racially restrictive covenants in the United States. Now, how is that relevant? Well, here's how that is relevant. Let me show you. Because we can put things into context, draw connections, relationships between things that people otherwise simply might not see. For example, Ferguson. Ferguson is a historically black neighborhood in St. Louis. People were, people, I think, at the time of the riots, had questions about Ferguson's history. Why this contentious relationship with the police? Why this concentration of, of a particular population in one small area? This town, Ferguson, is right on the border of the racially restrictive covenants at issue in Shelley versus Kramer. There is a reason why there's such a high concentration of people of a particular race in one area. And yes, the covenants themselves no longer are enforceable in court, but that doesn't change the historic legacy of them. And you can see that right here. Shelley v. Kramer's house, the Shelley v. Kramer house is right here. The red line marks the area of racially restrictive covenants. Here's where Michael Brown died. The distance is five miles. We can bring, and we should bring for our students, these old topics to life. They're living them, right? They're living them. This, this I think, is an obligation of ours, okay? To draw these connections, not just between concepts, but between historical periods, between today and the times that we're often forcing them, requiring them to read about, to show that it is an unbroken chain, okay? All right, so the point of all of that was that we, that our students learn best when they are able to see relationships between seemingly distinct or discrete phenomena that in fact aren't discrete at all. And it, some, one of our speakers earlier talked about not being able to tell if students are anxious because they're doing poorly or are poor, doing poorly because they're anxious. For me, when I have a map, when I can see the forest and the trees at the same time, my anxiety drops considerably. I don't keep asking, where am I? It makes a difference. And we've noticed it in, in the classrooms, the classes that have been using this technology. Uh, it hasn't been used in that many yet, but we've got it being used in law schools around the country, different professors, and so far, the reviews are amazing. In fact, the reviews are good enough that I didn't dare put up the statistics that, for our survey results because I thought they would look like I was faking them. So I didn't want to do that. <laughs> but now, this book, when you look at it, do you see any relationships? <laughs> Does it teach you anything? I, its format alone adds nothing to its pedagogical value. There's plenty of great information inside but its format adds nothing to its pedagogical value. And when you open it, randomly open it up, you'll be brought immediately face to face with one of the trees in the forest. And you'll never see the forest and the trees together. This, incidentally, is the book that sort of inspired me to do all this, <laughs> but I will go on. Now, anybody see any patterns? There's one here, I'll show it to you. That's the pattern here, right, the pricing. We're gouging our students. We don't even mean to be, but we're gouging our students. Charter course charts. It is a, it, remember I said I invested my kids' college money. It is a business. It's a private enterprise, but we charge $49 as opposed to 250 because we want to be responsible to our kids, okay, to our students. And I'll wrap it up here very quickly. What does the research say? Don't throw away that laptop. I know you heard that earlier, but don't do it. Because concept mapping benefits learners in ways that text does not. People read more broadly and more deeply based on concept maps. And the evidence about that is completely unequivocal. I'm happy to provide it later for you if you'd like. OK? 
okay? All right, now, one last thing as I wrap up. Remember, this is that night sky where the people saw the snake, right? Somehow, I don't know, do you see a snake when you look at this? Right? Incidentally, this is the night sky tonight over Maryland. Um, I got this for that reason from the, um, from, the Royal, from the Naval Observatory, yeah, in Maryland. But anyway, so some of these things, you know, we are able very quickly to find some things. Why? Because we've been trained to look for them, right? Big Dipper, Little Dipper, those are easy. Why? Not because they're there, but because we know to look for them, right? But you can actually, with a little practice, you start to see some other things as well. For example, if you follow the line, an interesting thing is about to happen. You're going to start anticipating where it goes. You're not just watching it happen, you're anticipating it, right? And sooner or later, with enough practice, you'll wonder, how did I ever not see it? It was there the whole time, right? That's learning by drawing, by drawing relationships between distinct points. It's gone now. Look at it closely. Look at it closely. It's going to disappear on you. If it's working, it's going to disappear on you. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> but now, now, even though it's out of sight, you'll have a, hard, a lot easier time finding it. Right? Okay. Um, anyway, that's it. Uh, anybody is interested, you could check out our website at chartercourse.com. Thank you very much.